Hello everyone, welcome back to Rotor Dynamics 101. Today we'll dive into the heart of centrifugal compressors and why its manufacturing precisions is absolutely critical to its performance. Impellers are more than just spinning blades. They set the entire stage for flow, head, and efficiency. If the geometry is off, even by a small margin, you could be looking at performance losses. There are three critical regions in impeller geometry. First is inlet. It sets the compressor's capacity and aligns the incoming flow. The second is the mid passage. This defines how smooth the flow path is through the impeller. The third is the impeller exit. Here is where the pressure rise and the head are determined. Every one of these regions plays a key role in determining overall performance. If the impeller's diameter or blade angle deviates from the design, it can cause a shift in the best efficiency point. And in severe cases, the entire performance map can be shifted. And if the shift is large enough, the compressor might completely miss its required performance targets. Let's zoom into the inlet region again, specifically the throat area. This throat area is essentially the space through which all the air or gas or liquid must flow. It sets the maximum capacity or choke limit of the impeller. The throat area is shaped by the distance between the adjacent blades and things like blade thickness and leading edge shape directly affect it. If the blades are too thick, the throat area shrinks and your overload capacity can take a hit. For a 200 millimeter diameter impeller, blade thickness isn't constant. It changes from the inlet to the mid passage and exit, typically ranging between one and two millimeters, depending on the locations for this example. But here's a catch. Small variations in blade thickness can have a big impact. That's why manufacturing specs include a dimensional tolerance. In this case, plus 8% and minus 22% of the blade thickness. The plus 8% upper tolerance are there for a reason, to make sure the throat area doesn't get too small during manufacturing. Again, if the blades get too thick, the flows get restricted and your compressor may fall short of capacity. At the midsection, factors such as the curvature along the shroud and the hub contours as well as the blade shape, can also influence the impeller capacity and behavior. That's why it's essential that they align well with the design geometry. Now let's go to the impeller exit region. Here's where the pressure rise or head is generated. Key factors here are the tip speed and tangential velocity. The tip speed depends on the exit diameter and shaft speed, while the exit tangential velocity depends on exit diameter, exit blade angle, exit width or passage height, and blade thickness at exit. Even a small change in these parameters can reduce the generated head or pressure ratio. That's why precise manufacturing is important. Let's dive into how impellers are manufactured. There are several manufacturing methods for impellers, including blade riveting, sand casting, fillet welding, spot welding, brazing, five axis machining, and many others. This slide compares riveted and welded impellers. As you might expect, riveted impellers typically lacks the strength and aerodynamic smoothness of welded design. Welded impellers offer better structural integrity, 
and a clear gas path, enabling them to withstand higher tip speed. Now let's look at the sand casting process for impellers. Sand casting involves pouring molten metal into an expandable sand mold, where it solidifies into the shape of the cavity. Here are typical steps. First step is pattern making, where a replica of impeller is created from a suitable material. The pattern is oversized to compensate for shrinkage during cooling. The second step is mold making. The sand is packed around the pattern to form a two-part mold. Most casting process involves the use of gating system. And sand casting is no exception. The mold consists of pouring cup and tunnel or gates, and it's used to funnel the molten mold into the mold cavity. Here, the mold pattern is placed in sand. Then the mold halves are aligned and clamped tightly to prepare for pouring. The induction furnace is lowered on the melting pot. Then the selected metal is placed in the melting pot. The selected metal is melted to the desired pouring temperature. Then the impurities are removed. The molted metal is poured into the mold quickly to avoid premature solidification. Many potential casting defects originate during this stage. After the molten metal has been poured into the mold cavity, we must wait for it to cool. Again, different type of metal takes different lengths of time to cool. Once the metal solidifies, the mold is broken apart and the casting is removed. Here you could see four impellers connected with the gating system. Some critical dimensions are finished through machining to meet tight tolerances. In this step, a rectangular key slot is machined onto the impeller. The impeller hub, which features this keyway slot, is then fitted over the shaft key to ensure the impeller rotates with the shaft and prevents slippage. 
Finally, the impellers is balanced to ensure stable, high-speed operation. It is important to adhere to industry balance standard, such as ISO, API, and others. The standard details the acceptable levels of remaining imbalance. To sum it up, impeller manufacturing isn't just about hitting nominal dimensions. It's about precision in critical regions, inlet, mid-passage, and exit. Because each directly affect how much flow, pressure, and efficiency you can extract from your compressor. If you are designing or evaluating impellers, don't overlook manufacturing tolerances. Thanks for watching. If you find this helpful, give it a like and subscribe for a more deep dive into rotating machinery. Thank you and see you in the next videos.